Hi everyone, this is uh, Sahana Lokesh. I'm the current uh, vice chairperson of uh, Sikasa Bengaluru. So uh, today by Bengaluru branch, we are organizing the tax audit session. And for the first day of tax audit, uh, we have a speaker, CA Ms. Rani Ennar. So uh, let me introduce her first. So uh, coming to uh, CA Rani Ennar, she is a fellow member of Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. Rani has been a partner in G. Ananta & Co., a Bangalore-based firm of chartered accountants since 2004 and has garnered experience of more than 18 years in the areas of statutory framework relating to not-for-profit sector and profit sector. Prior to that, she worked in Ernst & Young Private Limited, EY, for about one year. In addition to regular practice in the areas of audit and taxation, Rani's area of interest is an international taxation as well, for which she has completed the certification course from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, Bangalore, and also diploma in international taxation from ICAI. She has also authored a book on international taxation and co-authored books on transfer pricing. She has a master's degree in business laws and national law school from National Law School, Bangalore. Rani has spoken at various forums, including branches of ICAI and Direct Taxation Regional Training Institute, that is a DTRTI of Income Tax Department on matters relating to income tax and international taxation. So this is all about her, uh, which just goes on. So let's welcome uh, Ms. Rani Enar for this beautiful session that we are going to have from her. Uh, I think we can just thumbs up or... <laughs> We can welcome her by that way. Thank you. Thank you, Sahana. Thank you for that uh, introduction. And uh, it's always, always a pleasure to uh, talk to students. I, I firmly believe that the biggest learning happens when we uh, spend our time with students. So in my office also, the time which I enjoy is with my students. So. And I strongly believe that, especially when we are in this profession, uh, uh, especially in practice, uh, in a CA office, the energy of the office is uh, the students. So the partners, we when we sign the financial statements, the, the strength of the students, the commitment of the students that gives us the energy and confidence to sign our audit reports, I truly believe that. So uh, when... Uh, Sikasa chairman, Mr. I, I think uh, CA Virupaksha, when he contacted me today morning uh, about this tax audit session, uh, I was I immediately said yes because any opportunity to address students I always consider very valuable. Uh, so I don't have a, I don't have any PPT as it is. I have some bits and bits pieces of uh, uh, PPT today. Uh, so I'll be relying on some of the PowerPoint present some of the PowerPoint slides and then uh, the revised guidance not on tax audit by our Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. This is a material which we all refer, whether as partners or students, uh, whether in your first year of articleship or in your final stage of articleship or as audit assistants. The, the revised guidance note, the 2023 edition uh, of the CA guide, uh, the guidance note by Institute they have uh, released last week. So uh, I, I request all of you to uh, keep that uh, guidance note as your uh, guiding fa factor to close your tax audit. Now we have only another, uh, say today we are on 11th. Uh, yeah. Uh, so today we are on 11th, another uh, oh, 10th. What is this? Yeah. What is this guy doing? Why is everyone's name Namanjay? Yeah. Ah, so many Namanjays. Uh, can I ask everyone to mute yourselves? Uh, yes, or else uh, right. ask the institute to Come mute on. others, except the speaker. Yeah. So this, um, uh, as I was talking, today we are on 11th of September. All of us have the commitment to finish the audits by 30th September. So... This uh, workshop, which is planned for you, is for the next four days. This is being the first day. Today, I will try to give you an overview or rather introduction to this tax audit, why there is a tax audit, what is the need of it, and uh, some uh, basic idea about presumptive taxation, applicability. And if time permits, we will go through the form. 
uh, and whatever po clauses possible i will try to discuss and the next sessions coming uh, speakers will explain to you and complete the form for you guys so here we go we will go through the thing and uh, you can post your questions in the chat box i think that facility has been activated for you so we will take up the questions maybe in the middle of the session depending on the time or we'll finish the uh, whole session and then uh, i will take up the questions so let's start uh, so audit uh, we understand in our ca firm this is one of the primary functions what we perform in our ca office whether you are in the first year of article ship or second year or third year or even as audit assistants or including the partners or uh, you are employee after qualifying whatever it is the the one of the key areas of operations which a ca firm will be doing will be audit which will be either an internal audit or a statutory audit or a gst audit or uh, even for this matter this tax audit under the income tax act so audit is our keyword so what does it mean this this document which i have displayed to you is the uh, revised uh, guidance not on tax audit the 2023 edition so basically audit is as we understand it is a review so it is a checker checker work in the sense somebody has given you a basic set of documents and based on the documents given to us we are supposed to verify or review or inspect the the given document uh, uh, be it if a, be it, uh, financial statements or uh, be it a tax audit report or uh, 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 annexure to the report or be it a certificate whatever given to us we have to do an attestation function so audit is always uh, the the function what we do to do attestation in our capacity as chartered accountants so as in from a, from a layman's point of view or from common parlance audit is a word which involves checking reviewing inspecting verifying under the prescribed statute so when we have to Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this, uh, so we are supposed to do the attestation function. Uh, that is our mandate as chartered accountants. Now, today we are going to discuss. So, uh, today what we are going to discuss is, uh, is what the season warrants. Now we are in the month of September. So we are, uh, as chartered accountants. See, I address you as chartered accountants only because in front of me, though I am not seeing you guys. You just have to cross an exam according to you according to me that exam is only a bridge in your work in when you approach a work you should consider yourself as a chartered accountant so, except you have no power to sign the document in front of you you have to think you have to act and you have to perform your work as chartered accountants only so deliberately i am addressing you as chartered accountant because all of us are in just because i was born 20 years before you i could I got an opportunity to do the CA before you and I finished the CA. Otherwise, all of us are doing the work in the capacity as professional. So all of you, I want all of you to think you are going to do this audit and you are going to sign the tax audit report, right? 
So as chartered accountants, as I told you, this, this particular September warrants us to or requires us to certify a tax audit report. What is it is a tax audit? It is an audit under the Income Tax Act. So Income Tax Act, as you know, has a certain provisions as a mandate when a particular assessee has to be subjected to audit. So what is a tax audit? I know all of all of us are familiar with when is the liability and the sections. Wherever possible, I'll try to touch upon the sections. Uh, I will quickly glance through the relevant sections, but that may not be enough. I want all of you to go back and read the original document. When I say original document, all of you have to open the Income Tax Act and read the relevant sections. If you are in the first year of articleship and you are not able to understand and comprehend because I am sure that all of you have learned the provisions of tax audit from your study material or from your tuition notes. Uh, of course, that is well and good as a student and that is what is warranted for you as a student. But this is an opportunity to you to get familiar with how to read the act because finally at the end of the day when you are going to perform your duty as a professional, you need to be familiar how to read an act. So make this opportunity the best to make yourself comfortable. See, there is a way how to read a read a statute. There is a way how to read an income tax act. First, first, you might find it difficult. Even we find it difficult sometimes. So irrespective of the number of years of practice, really, sometimes I also get stuck when we read the act. So it comes with practice. Uh, so take if you are in the first year or second year or not, you are not familiar or you have never touched that act. Uh, please take please finish this session go back to your office and next four days when you're attending this workshop make sure you keep your uh, keep your income tax act the latest one which is relevant for this audit uh, i will tell you which which uh, act is relevant that income tax act you have to keep and read the sections take the help of your seniors to understand the sections i'm sure if no senior is helping please get into the partner's cabin and take the help of partner your partner will be very much happy and appreciate you of your effort so coming back to our topic today, the income tax audit, the tax audit is under the Income Tax Act. The year, the financial year, we understand the word previous year, all CS students will understand the word previous year. Previous year is nothing but the financial year. The financial year relevant for this audit, what we are going to sign in the next 15 days, we are going to focus on a tax audit for the financial year. April 20, April 1st, 2022 to March 31st, 2023. So the financial year is 22, 23 and assessment year is 23 24 so you need to guy you guys have to go back and take your uh, the income tax act which says as amended by finance act 2022 because the next act which is a blue color book amended by finance act 2023 would have come to your office but please make sure you are reading 2022 because that is what is relevant for this audit now the the first first and foremost section which is relevant is Section 44AB. Let me read this one paragraph for you and from there we'll take it forward. Income tax law requires the taxpayer, that is the assessee, to get the audit of the accounts of his business or profession from the viewpoint of income tax law. So here are certain keywords I'm going to highlight. I hope you can see what I'm highlighting. So there is a law, as I told you, any audit is based on a law. So the relevant law is income tax law. And it requires whom to get the accounts audited? The taxpayer. So we are going to do the accounts of a taxpayer, a taxpayer. So a tax audit report is for an assessee. An assessee could be a person. Person is defined under section 2, subsection 31 of the Income Tax Act. So the person could be... Uh, a trust, uh, an association of persons, a society. So any any uh, any of these persons will have a tax audit. So the taxpayer is very important. So one of the questions which you have in the annexure to the tax audit report, which you are going to see, is the category of the assessee. So this taxpayer is very important, and each taxpayer will have their own distinct PAN number. So make sure that the taxpayer with the file which you are handling, who is the taxpayer, what is the status of that person, whether they are companies, LLP or a company or a individual. You have to know that it is very important. Uh, one, one quick uh, uh, tip is if you see the PAN number, 
if the fourth alphabet is a p p for a parrot or peacock that p denotes the taxpayer is an individual if the fourth alphabet is of f it denotes a partnership firm if it is c it denotes a company if it is t it denotes a trust so on and so forth even an llp is uh, is a firm firm uh, includes an llp so even for an llp it will be uh, f so please check the status of your entity that is very very important because some of the provisions the applicability of provisions are very critical when you take the the status of the ssc is very critical to determine the applicability of the provisions then to get the audit so the process what we are going to do is audit it is not accounting it is not uh, fi it is not uh, uh, you know uh, uh, any other function like a certification it is an audit of the accounts what are we going to do we are going to check i told you in the beginning we have a mandate to check whatever given to us so we are going to check the accounts of his business the his includes her also so the persons the taxpayers business or profession from the point of view of which law income tax law so this we have to be in your head very clear the statute the relevant statute is income tax law we are going to check the accounts relating to the business or profession so this is very important so in your income tax act chapter 4 talks about computation of business income in your own term i i, I know how students call it pgbp for profits and gains of business or profession so we are so as you know when you compute the income of a person there are five heads of income i wish this was a physical class so that i can interact with students but this being virtual uh, we i i, I don't have the luxury of interacting with students so i assume you guys are answering okay so this is a uh, business or profession so under the five heads of income there is we have the salary which is based on an employment contract then recently we all have finished our july season so i'm sure that all of you have become experts in in, uh, in the in these five heads of income the next head of income income from house property which is a rental income from a land or a building let out there is a tenant and landlord relationship between the taxpayer so rental income is basically reported then the third category of income is income from business or profession which we are going to discuss now and the fourth category is income from capital gains which comes from the transfer of a capital asset section 45 Uh, uh, onwards it uh, starts with 45 to 55 uh, it it talks about capital gains and 56 onwards we have other sources which uh, which ca captures the income which is not specific to any heads of income so coming to our point uh, in this in this tax audit we the focus is only on one category of heads of income which is business or profession so other four head heads of income are not relevant so to have a tax audit the first and foremost condition is the taxpayer should have an income from a business or profession and the relevant statute for us is only income tax law of course as a part of the tax audit report you may have to have familiarity with other statutes like gst or even uh, employ employees protection fund act some of other uh, statutory requirements of course uh, as we, as you come across the relevant clause if i come across i'll discuss or the relevant the, the particular speaker the respective speaker will uh, will uh, address that now the most important so as you know income tax act has sections so we we understand the provisions by way of a section so the 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 section which you can never forget in life is section 44 ab this is the section which warrants a tax audit for a taxpayer let's just quickly read this one paragraph for you to get a base Section forty four A B entails the provisions relating to the class of taxpayers who are required to get their accounts audited from a chartered accountant. So here, the audit has to be done by a chartered accountant. The report has to be signed by a chartered accountant, and the audit under Section forty four A B of the Income Tax Act aims to aim. So it is saying. it is saying what is the purpose what why we have to get the accounts audited aims to ascertain the compliance of various provisions of income tax law and the fulfillment of other requirements of the income tax law so this is the purpose of this audit they have to make sure the auditor the chartered accountant has to get the accounts audited 
of the taxpayer under section 44ab to ascertain the extent of compliance of the relevant provisions which affects his business or profession and we have the reporting requirement the audit conducted by the chartered accountant of the accounts of the taxpayer in pursuance of the requirement of 44ab is called a tax audit so when in a common parlance if we talk tax audit it is understood as income tax audit though there is an audit under gst it is also a tax audit because gst is also a tax but when we simply say tax audit it, people understand it as audit under the income tax act now uh, just quickly two three paras to the chartered accountant conducting the tax audit is required to give his findings observation in form so what is the form in which we have to report obviously there should be a form we can't adopt the form what we like you can't take a white paper and write whatever you want you can't do that as you know we have under the companies those who are familiar with the company audit if you have not if you have done you remember what i'm talking if you have not done just listen you go back to your study material this will be there in the study material uh, so uh, what I wanted to say, don't have a block in your mind, especially those who are facing this season for the first time or those who have not done the tax audit. Please take out that block from your head that you have not done or you don't know or you don't understand. Mostly, I will try my best to ensure to include all the category of CA students here from first year to uh, the final year students. I will try to talk as much as possible in an inclusive way. But if it, at some point you are not understanding, please Take a note of it and go back to your office and read it or take the help of your seniors. Don't have a mental block thinking that you are a first year article. I will never get to do a tax audit. So I don't have to listen to this. Never have that block. Please keep your eyes, ears and brain open to this. Okay. So coming back, the, the findings and the relevant form. Any audit report should have a form. You can't take a white paper and write whatever you want. So what I wanted to say is, as you know, when you do an audit of a company, the audit report format is prescribed by the Companies Act itself under CARO, or that is Companies Auditors Report Order. In addition to that, in addition to that, we as CAs refer to standards and auditing issued by the Chartered Accountants of India, where you have SA 700, SA 701, 702, uh, a clear report, a qualified report, an adverse report. So we have to uh, make sure that we understand the standards on auditing we stick to that SA 700 format so that is a format for reporting here under the income tax act the relevant audit report format is form 3c a or b so why two forms that will come uh, going forward the report of the tax audit is to be given by a chartered accountant in form number 3c a or 3c b so there are two categories of audit report which is 3c a or 3c b and the annexure to the audit report is common for both the, uh, both the forms, either 3CA or 3CB, that is form 3CD. So this form 3CD is the, is the document what we are going to have uh, understand in the, uh, you are going to understand this form, the annexure which has 44 questions and that is what you are going to discuss in the next four days. And what is the objective? Why we have to do tax audit? One of the objectives of tax audit is to ascertain and derive the requirement of Form 3CD and report in Form 3CA, 3CB. Apart from reporting requirements of Form 3CA, 3CB, an audit for tax purposes would assure that the books of account and other records are properly maintained. So there is a mandate under Section 44AA. I will come to that section. 44AA, where books have to be maintained by the taxpayer. and the the audit the auditor's mandate is to make sure that he has maintained it properly the word properly is very critical he has to maintain in a proper way to ascertain the income of the taxpayer and other requirements and they reflect a true and correct this word is very critical please remember this it is not true and fair so as auditors one minute sorry so as auditors, as auditors, we are, we usually in our audit reports, we, these expressions are very, very critical. We certify either true and fair or true and correct. You have to understand the difference between true and correct and true and fair. When we give an opinion to the accounts as true and fair, it means it is not, it may, it may be, we are not checking the, what we are certifying is every each and everything is not correct it is fair so there is a difference between correct and fair 
See, for example, see, for example, when we certify a balance sheet under the Companies Act, we certify that it is true and fair. The, the financial statements, if you have not read the audit report, please go back and read SA 700. It says the, the financial statements give a true and fair view of the accounts. Why? Why? Because take the case of fixed assets. The fixed assets value is reflected at a return down value. What is return down value? The cost minus the depreciation. What is the cost? Let us assume an asset has been purchased for 100 rupees and there is a depreciation of 10 rupees and 100 minus 10 rupees, 90 rupees is reflected in the financial statements. Now, when I certify this, when we certify this balance sheet, uh, this 90 rupees worth fixed assets, we are relying on the numbers and obviously if it was a first year of purchase, we would have seen the bills, so on and so forth. Very unlikely we would have seen the asset or we would have done a valuation as on the date of 31st March. What is the value of that asset? Are we going to the market? No, we have to record the asset at historical value. That is one of the primary assumptions or conventions under the... Uh, under the uh, yes, ma'am, you are audible. Uh, so, uh, so now I'm... I'm uh, continuing with this from my phone. So I, I hope you guys can see my screen. Yes, yes. And there is no echo also. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Yeah. I don't know where uh, you lost me. Uh, so I was, uh, I was just trying to explain what is a uh, difference between true and fair view and true and correct. So true and fair is when we certify something on fair value basis, on fair basis, you understand the word fair. True and correct is very simple. Whatever we are saying, it is like your name, like or rather number. When somebody, when we say that somebody has deducted tax at source at ten percent and paid the TDS amount by seventh of next month or sixth of next month or twenty fifth of next month, it is a fact. So the the that true and correct has a lot of relevance and for your understand for your kind information. Tax audit report we certify as true and correct. That is why it has a lot of importance, unlike true and fair view. And since we are trying, there is the, the, the positive thing of signing a true and correct audit report is there is very less room for judgment. When you say judgment, uh, interpretation, although, I mean, it is a fact what we are reporting. Whenever there we have a confusion, uh, if we are not sure that something we are reporting is not correct, we need to have a disclaimer or we need to have a separate uh, document filed along with the audit report saying this is what we understand by this. It may be correct or based on this assumption we have certified is true and correct. Now, as far as the income tax office is concerned, why they need this audit report is it, facilit it facilitates the administration of tax law by proper presentation of the accounts before the tax authorities and considerably save the time of the assessing officer. Assessing officer to to in carrying out the routine verifications like checking the correctness of totals, verifying purchases, sales, and the time of the assessing officer could be saved for attending to more important investigational aspects. So this is very, very important. We are actually, with this tax audit report, we are enabling the assessing officers to conduct their audit. So that is the responsibility cast upon us. So please uh, keep this in mind. That's why I wanted you to understand the responsibility cast upon each of each and every one of us don't ever think that the report is signed by the partner so you don't have any responsibility that will not make you a good professional i'm telling you uh, this i'm not talking as a partner uh, perhaps when i was a student this information or this this clarity we never got so i was always thinking that tax audit report is not something which we have to take seriously but later I realized if I had that understanding that if I had considered tax audit much more serious, serious. Uh, see, as far as a partner is concerned, of, of course, he has the responsibility to sign it and answerable to the client and the tax authorities. But as far as a student is concerned, if you really, really do your tax audit with full focus, and as I told, whatever questions you are going to get in the tax audit, please go back and read your notes, your sections. Definitely, you are going to get very good marks in your DT, your direct tax paper, and direct tax, if you can score more than 50, whether you are in CA uh, 
you know, or Inter or CF final, it is, it is really a relief. That paper will stand alone and it is a scoring paper. Unlike uh, auditing or company law, that was a tough paper from my point of view. I don't know. There are some students who have scored 80 plus in auditing also. But uh, DT is definitely a scoring paper for that. Please focus on your tax audit. Don't think that it is partner's responsibility. For you, it may not be a responsibility. It is an opportunity which you will never get once you finish your CA. Once you are out of your articleship, uh, whether you are going to practice, don't also don't think some of the students might think that you are not going to practice after this CA, you are going to get into an industry, you are going to to a corporate uh, where you will not be doing an attestation function. Fair enough, you may not be signing a financial statement, but definitely as a chartered accountant, they expect it from expectation from you, whether you are in audit or whether you are in taxation or whether you are in budgeting or whether you are an overall finance controller or a CFO or whether you are in a, in a remote, uh, I mean, you are not in a core finance area also. The whatever principles you are understanding here is really going to get you through in your profession as a CA. So this is the, uh, the requirement of the government and as auditors, this is our responsibility. Now, coming back to the original thing, uh, the basic is we saw that in the first para, uh, who has to get the accounts audited? A person who carries on his business or profession. So let us understand what is a business and what is a profession. As I, before starting the present, I have a very two, three or two or three slides on business or profession. But to you, my dear uh, students, this business or profession, since the beginning of Income Tax Act, this, these two expressions have been litigated. Even now, even after 20 years of practice or my seniors where we listen to after 40 years of practice or 50 years of practice, this is still a matter of debate and litigation. Even now, we are getting litigation points to interpret whether a particular activity is a business or profession. So always, 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 somebody can say uh, activity of a person as business, whereas somebody can always interpret it as a profession. So I don't have a clear cut answer. Definitely facts and circumstances of the case, your judgment, then certain tips and uh, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain tips or uh, rather techniques or some conditions we can apply to distinguish between business or profession, but definitely this is, there is no clear cut answer to this even now. So apply your mind. Why I'm telling this, there could be a situation where the you are opening a taxpayer's file and you think it has a profession, but somebody would have filed the uh, audit report. There is a clause which specifically talks under section 44AB, clause A talks about business and clause B talks about profession. So in your tax audit report, one question is, to choose the relevant clause under the tax audit report as to which is the which is the uh, whether the taxpayer is doing a business or a profession so there is always the possibility that when you see the last year's audit, audit when i say last year previous year 31st march 2022 audit report you are always thinking the taxpayer is doing a business but the report has been filed as a profession or by isosa there could be always a chance that time don't leave it please ask your partner or a seniors and find out there could be definitely a basis based on which the decision has been taken in the office. Now, let me go back to the presentation. What is business or profession? The definition as per the Income Tax Act is very simple. Business is defined as any trade, commerce or manufacture or any adventure or concern in the nature of trade, commerce or manufacture. Now, trade, we understand very easily what is a trade. A trade is a case where you will trade with goods. A trader is a person who will sell goods. That is a simple understanding. When we render services as chartered accountants, when when we we are called as service professionals, nobody says that you are into the trade of uh, CA profession. So trade, we understand a common parlance, goods are involved. Then commerce is a very large term, very large, a very, very large term. Commerce means the activity which has very, very simple way I can tell is when an activity is carried on with an intention to make profit. That is a simple definition of a commerce. The profit includes losses. So when an activity is carried out with an intention to make a profit, it is commerce. And commerce is a very wide term. So this is a simple way to understand commerce or manufacture. So trader is a person who doesn't do manufacture. They will buy and sell. Whereas a manufacturer is a person who produce something from the basic uh, 
basic things uh, what are the basic things from the raw materials labor uh, he will produce something so he uh, so the, the business includes a manufacturer also a manufacturing uh, operations will have a factory set up and so on and so forth basically so it includes manufacture then any adventure or concern in the nature so if you act, do any activity any activity which is having the characteristic of a trade either it should be a trade or commerce again put your definition what is a commerce there should be an intention of profit or manufacture it is called a business so when you when you see the activity of a taxpayer please try to apply these principles is he selling goods or is he rendering service whether intention is to make profit or is he a manufacturer is he producing something from basic stuff as raw materials and putting labor and produce something is he converting one form of a of an item to another form of an item is he converting plastic to plastic chair so all these questions should come to your mind this is business for you and this definition is there in section 28 so business definition uh, business is defined in section 2 uh, so section 28 that uh, chapter on business talks about the computation what are the allowable deductions what are the uh, disallowances so on and so forth now what is a profession very very simple they have defined profession includes vocation now vocation if you see the dictionary meaning or profession if you see the dictionary meaning especially the easy way to understand profession is it 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 warrants a basic qualification or a technical knowledge i would call it as a technical knowledge unlike a trader see i can today start a stationery shop even if i don't know how to read and write right i don't know how to read out i don't know any language but still if i have money to invest if i have the capital i can open a shop which sells goods which uh, a stationery shop i can open and i can put somebody who can read and write to do the billing and managing the clients so it doesn't warrant a specified body of knowledge i i won't call it a, uh, i mean uh, we have specified profession so just understand a, a particular skill or a body of knowledge or a particular technical knowledge is required for a person to carry out profession so for, in a simple term we can say that a person carry uh, an individual uh, will have a profession uh, will have a set of knowledge so whenever we think of profession immediately they i am not telling this is this is not a final answer i am telling you i am giving you the ideas and whatever i have come across in my experience to help you to make a distinction between business or profession so when we say somebody is carrying on business we can understand that it need not that person can be an owner but he need not even present in the shop or he need not have the qualification or he, nobody is coming looking forward for the knowledge or a skill or a specialization or an experience of a particular person we go to big bazaar we go to a supermarket are we really bothered about who is the owner or what is his degree or what is his qualification nothing right we are just going into the shop and looking for whatever stuff we want and we are coming out whereas if we are going to a hospital or if we are going to a clinic let us say if you are going to a clinic or if you are going to a lawyer's office right we are looking forward to meet a person or persons or a set of people uh, who can give us a specialized knowledge or a specialized experience or a, they can solve a particular problem of ours where we have specific issues to be addressed this is one test you can make at this point let us understand we all go to doctors i would like to take that example there is a small clinic next to your house and you fell sick and your parents will take you to that small particular clinic there we are going to uh, look forward to meet a doctor or a set of doctors uh, or or a particular physician or a specialist or um, whom we can meet and you are going to discuss your uh, problems and he is going to ask you some questions and he is going to give you uh, some advices and he'll, if he's a, uh, he is going to prescribe some medicines to solve your problem or he is going to write to you please do a series of tests and come back to me with that report so that i can understand what is happening and advise you how to solve the problem so we are looking for a specialized knowledge with a person or a person it need not be one person we will meet sometimes end up meeting four people or five people that is a, so definitely we are saying that he is a doctor or he is practicing a profession uh, which is a medical profession right now the same example 
the same disease you are going to a hospital like say apollo hospital there what happens of course you want to meet a doctor of course you want a specialized knowledge of course you want a solution for your problem of course we want a prescription with a list of medicines and list of tests you have to underwent undergo but in addition to that there is an establishment see we definitely we understand the difference between a clinic and a hospital right what what do you in our head what is a hospital in addition to that particular specialized knowledge they give additional facilities like they give you a bed if you are getting admitted they give you a lab facility they give they might give you an ambulance facility they might have a canteen and there is a set of people who are taking care of you other than doctors right uh, some relation if you, if you go to a little bigger hospital you will have a relationship manager you will have a cleaning person you will have somebody who will attend to you on a uh, on your needs other than medical needs like some hospital give a facility like some attendants will come and they will ask you do you need a food or do you need me to get a medicine for you so there is an attendant there is a cleaner there is a there is a bed facility available there is a medical pharmacy available so there are there is a set of services and facilities provided to you as a bundle as a package when you go to a hospital rather than when you are going to a clinic right so if i tell uh, for the time being i know somebody can get a doubt like a hospital is a charity let's not get into that for the time being we for our limited understanding we think that the hospital see both the doctor who conducts who is running a, a small clinic uh, or uh, and a, a apollo hospital a big hospital all of them are carrying out the activity to earn the profit right now they might put the profit back to their own uh, activities that is a different that is application of profit so they are conducting a commerce they have they are conducting activity to earn a profit and many people make their livelihoods out of it there are a set of employees there are a set of doctors there are attenders drivers so on and so forth many people living with that establishment and the scale of operations it is not some two people one nurse and one attender and one doctor there is a series of people the scale of operations is different there is a building there is an establishment if you can imagine the profit and loss account of a hospital you imagine there will be salaries crores uh, salaries rent facilities housekeeping traveling then uh, cleaning expenses a uh, lot of expenses you repairs maintenance many things whereas compared to that a clinic you imagine definitely all these categories will be there there will be a rent there will be salary but the scale of operations is another thing so you are so scale is one criteria where we can distinguish between a business and a profession this is as i told you is not a clear cut uh, answer but that is one test you can put where we say that we got to we go, we went to a clinic or we went to a lawyer's office he is a practicing lawyer or he is practicing law, uh, chartered accountant or he is practicing doctor or he is pra he is practicing architect or even if he is not a professional he has not qualified with an exam we go to a small establishment where three uh, uh, say uh, somebody drafting a, a, a plan a, a plan for your house they are not architects they are just dr drawing the plan for you so architect you have discussed with an architect and architect is giving some ideas and you are going to an office where three people are drawing your uh, ideas right there could be a situation where you want to build your own house and first you meet a, a set of people who will draw your plan what is in your head and with that plan you go to an architect and give the input so so there is a specialized knowledge the person who is drawing the plan may not have been may not be a qualified architect mean, mean to say he wouldn't have passed a qualifying exam but he is helping you in the process with his skill of drawing right even in our ca office let us understand an accountant for example he he is not a chartered accountant he is not qualified ca exam but definitely he has a technical knowledge of accounting he knows bookkeeping he knows principles of accounting so that is also a professional so these are some of the uh, tests you can put where there is a technical skill involved and more personal and more uh, people oriented or it depends on one person than an institution that could be one criteria to think whether there to see whether it is a profession or a business so dictionary meaning of profession is an occupation especially one requiring advanced education and special training this is a dictionary meaning i don't even uh, put the word advanced even a specialized knowledge can be a profession so going forward with this
the expression and profession involves idea of an occupation requiring purely intellectual skill or manual skill controlled by the intellectual skill of an operator as distinguished from an operation which is substantially the production or sale or an arrangement for production or sale of commodities. So this is one judicial precedent where in CIT versus Manmohan Das, Supreme Court gave a definition of a, uh, or rather an explanation for a profession. Now, going forward, so going back as students, your job is to see, apply your mind. I mean, can it be interpreted as business? Can it be interpreted as a profession? What are the criteria? See, there could be some thin line of difference where always, always every tax audit season, we have this debate in our office where somebody will tell that it is a profession, it is a business. So it is, it is always a matter of interpretation and facts of the case and scale of operations and circumstances, evidence, all those things you have to put it to test. Now, examples of business, manufacturing, wholesale, trading, these are all some examples for you to apply your thought process. Profession, this you understand very well. Uh, profession. Then, what is income from business or profession? So, Section 28 definition, it is defined. Business income or professional income, profits on sale of license. Other than only uh, professional income, there are some other categories of income which has been included within the scope of Section 28. This is very important because if it falls within the defin definition of section 28, we are compelled to apply the provisions of tax audit and see whether tax audit is applicable if they are complying with the conditions applicable for a tax audit. Profits on sale of a license. License is, what is a license? If you, if any of them have come across a pharma industry audit, they get a license to import goods at a uh, lower tax duty. Suppose they are manufacturing a generic drug and they have to import some raw materials from another country by paying a customs duty. They get a license. If they meet their export obligations, they get a license to import the goods at a lesser rate. So license is nothing but a right, right? A tally license. What do you mean by license? You get a driving license. What is a driving license? It is a document which gives you the right to drive the car, drive the vehicle on the road. So if somebody sells a license, there are certain licenses which actually the definition of goods under GST includes a license. So there are certain licenses. If somebody gets a license, you can sell the license. See, we as a, a see, I, have, I have qualified, I finished my CA, I get a license to practice my profession. I get a certificate of practice uh, from the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. <coughs> Sorry, which gives me the license to certify the accounts. Can I sell that license? Definitely no, because it is given to me uh, with my membership number by the institute. Whereas if somebody gets a license to import raw material or somebody gets a license to buy certain goods or somebody, for example, you have Amazon voucher. Uh, am I not audible? Uh, Ma'am, you're audible, but I think the screen is stuck, if I'm not wrong, or... Uh... Yeah, now... The... Screen is moving? Uh, no, ma'am. Visib I mean, audible is perfect, but visibility, there is an issue, I guess. Okay, maybe stop sharing and I'll share it again. Yeah. So, uh, coming to the discussion, uh, what I was stated... So coming back to license, uh, the license is a right. So there are some licenses which you can sell, license to uh, buy goods. For example, somebody gives you an Amazon voucher to buy certain things from Amazon. Somebody gifted to you that, and you can give that voucher to your friend and she can buy. So that is a license. So there could be a profit that is taxed as business income. Then cash assistance given by government for doing exports. This is what I was trying to tell where if the pharma company or any export company meet an obligation, government gives some cash assistance like a duty drawback. Those who have come across pharma audit will know 
or anybody doing an export will know that they will get a they will get some duty drawback the government will give them some rebates and benefits that is taxed under business head then uh, profit on transfer of duty and detriment pass pick is also under uh, customs then value of any benefit or perquisite so if you have got any perquisite for example i am a chartered accountant i get a fees in addition to that fees if the client is giving me a facility to enjoy something the value of that is also taxable in my hands uh, so that is a perquisite so that uh, that income is also taxed under uh, business now interest salary bonus commission or remuneration received by partner of a firm so this is very important see interest income as you understand it is taxed under other sources salary income is taxed under income from salary even bonus is a part of the salary as per the definition of section uh, 15 uh, the salary is uh, section 15 to uh, 23 uh, sorry 21 um, you have uh, rather so section 15 to 20 you have salary chapter where salary is defined and salary uh, includes bonus then commission is business income nobody has doubt uh, remuneration remuneration is also a salary in the nature of salary but the word remuneration is used in the context of a firm so it is by a partner of a firm so when i say firm it could be a partnership firm or an llp this particular Uh, interest or salary or bonus or commission or remuneration to say by partner of a firm is taxed under business chapter not under uh, salary or other sources and any sum received under a keyman insurance policy keyman insurance policy there there could be some companies which might have taken policy on uh, the keyman who is the keyman the director uh, who who is uh, is managing the business they would have taken a policy in their name so uh, that insurance policy if they get matured uh, the premium paid is uh, being considered as an expenditure in the profit and loss account uh, so that when you claim the expenditure any uh, benefit come flowing to the company uh, will be taxed in the hands of the company uh, when there is a key man uh, insurance so if you have any key man insurance receipt uh, in your books of accounts of your tax payer then please uh, make sure that there is a possibility that people think it is nothing to do with business and it is considered as other sources please be very very careful if there is any if there is uh, there is there is a chance that there is a chance that it is a key man insurance receipt but the accountant would have shown it under other income he would not have even used the word uh, you know came an insurance you would have just accounted it as other income in your tally or in your zoho books or whatever software you are using the, your client is using for books of accounts that there is a 5 lakh received under other income and when somebody gave you a financial statements in the profit and loss account uh, income from sale of goods or sa sale of services and there is a consultancy income and there, there you find another income 5 lakhs and profit and loss account includes this other income there is all the chance that we miss this and we can we, we assume that uh, this is a business income but unfortunately uh, uh, th there is a possibility this other income is considered as other sources it is not a business income you would have oh madam you are not uh, audible the accountant has assumed it is not a business income there is a chance we miss it please be very very sure you ask this specific question if you are not in a position to ask to your client make sure your partner or the audit manager whom you are reporting is asking this question to the client what is do you have any receipts from keyman insurance policy uh, most of the cases there will be a tds done on this policy proceeds if it is not there also be alert to this fact and uh, be sure that you are considering it uh, as your business receipt then going forward computing now 
as we proceed we understand business there is a profession and now the next method is next is how to compute the income because basically the income tax department is interested in collecting the taxes and tax is collected on taxable income so there are separate methods and systems to compute the income as you know under each head of income under salary you have a separate method to compute the income under income from house property there is a separate method described under section 22 to 25 to compute your income from house property then so uh, capital gains there is a perfect method there is a prescribed method so under section uh, 56 to 57 there is a method so like that business income also you have the big chapter from 28 to uh, 44 where uh, you have to follow the specific methods to compute the taxable income there are prescribed set of allowances of expenses there are prescribed set of disallowances and there is this wonderful presumptive taxation so there are two methods there is a presumptive method and there is a normal method now one of the main topics for this turnover your gross sales your gross receipts is within a particular limit the tax authorities have presumed that your income should be at least this much rate your profit should be at least eight percent or six percent when i say this percentage those who have read income tax act the corresponding sections should come to your head if a taxpayer is carrying on a business and if the person has opted for a presumptive taxation so it is an option please use this please remember this person carrying on a business has opted so that means he has a choice to file his uh, do his computation of income under business either on presumptive method or under normal method please understand this and if the person has opted presumptive method then he has to declare a minimum percentage of profit of eight percent eight percent if his receipts are in the nature if it, if it, the, if the money what comes in from the sale of goods or from his business i mean from whatever business he is doing if the receipts come in the form of both cash and bank means physical cash somebody selling vegetable you can't say that he gets all the money only through the banking channel when i say banking channel it could be your google pay uh, upa payments also it is not necessary we, many times we end up paying physical cash to such vendors or even service providers when i say service providers don't get confused i'm not talking about profession now we are discussing only service provider who is falling within the definition of business okay not a, uh, not a profession so there could be some situations where they have the money coming in from the sale of goods or rendering of service in physical cash also so such people will if that that person opts for a presumptive method under section 44 ad the section is 44 ad ad and opting for a presumptive method then if the receipts includes cash and bank receipts then the presumptive rate is 8%. 8% is the minimum rate. If you see the section, I will show the section also. Before showing the section, I want to say that is the presumed minimum rates of profit as per the Income Tax Act. There could be a possibility based on the, uh, uh, based on the data available with you, the taxpayer is making a profit bigger than 8%. In that case, you are expected to report higher percentage of profit this is the minimum percentage of profit presumed by the income tax act so the person should carry on business the relevant section is 44 ad the percentage is 8% if the money is coming in includes cash suppose the money is coming in only in the form of banking channel by way of check or draft or upi payments or neft payments all the electronic modes then the minimum presumed rate of profit is 6% okay whatever i'm talking is there in the section 
with this basic we will read the section one quickly yeah ma'am your screen is not visible yeah let me see what is happening one minute we try the zoom is logging me out Uh, screen window. Now is it visible? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. So forty-four AD is the section, but presumptive rates is eight percent or six percent, depending upon the nature of receipts. Whether if it include cash, you cannot take eight percent. It is uh, sorry, you have to consider eight percent. If it is only through electronic mode, six percent is the minimum presumed rate. Again and again, I'm using the word minimum. Don't think that six percent is the only rate. There, there is a possibility based on the data available. Again, why I'm saying data available because it is not mandatory to for the person opting for presumptive taxation to have compulsory maintenance. Or rather, I'm not telling that uh, he will not have books of accounts. Definitely, bank statements he will have. He will have filed his GST returns. He will have some cash receipts. He will have the receipt book. All those things will be available. But he, he it is not necessary that he should have a cash book, a journal, or a, a prescribed book uh, for some for some category. There is a prescribed set of books. So that is not mandatory for him to maintain. So from the data available, if there includes non cash payment cash payments also, then the minimum rate is eight percent. So there is a possibility the profit is more means you have to declare that profit in the computation. Then another important criteria for a person who is carrying on business to opt for presumptive taxation is the limit. The turnover cannot exceed two crore. We have a slide on the definition of turnover. Basically, for your common understanding as students, it is sales. You can understand the sales, the turnover, the gross receipt. If the person is following cash basis of accounting, you know there is two method of accounting: cash basis and accrual basis, or rather mercantile basis. What is cash basis? You will account the receipt only after you receive it, and you will show the expenses only after you pay it. You will not pass a payable entry or a receivable entry. So, if you can think of sales, there will not be any credit sale entry in the books. What is credit sale entry? Debiting the party, debiting the sundry debtor, and crediting income. Right? This entry, which is a, which is an accrual entry. It is not a cash entry. It is a journal entry. There will not be any cash or bank debited. Such accrual method, depending upon the method of accounting followed by the SSC, the turnover has to be determined. So that is why they use the word turnover or sales or gross receipt. A person is following cash basis means it is receipt basis. What is receipt basis? Only cash sales. There will not be credit sales. You will have only debit bank credit income or debit cash credit income. Uh, and as far as expense is concerned. In the case of a mercantile basis or accrual basis of accounting, there will be journal entries where you will account the expenditure on accrual basis. What is accrual basis? Salary to salary payable. As on the close of the month, the salary is not paid. For example, March salary is dispersed in the month of April, but as on 31st March, when the books are closed or when the person is um, uh, uh, making a note of the expenses, books are not maintained, he is writing in a paper. This is the salary which I paid. Or salary payable will be accounted. That is called accrual basis. And cash basis is only when the actual outflow you have to pay by check or a cash. The salary has to be paid. That is cash basis. That is why the turnover definition includes gross receipts and or sales or turnover. And the limit is two crores. So if somebody's top line or rather gross sales or turnover exceeds two crore, they cannot opt for presumptive taxation. This again, be sure that the person is doing this this. Limit is applicable for a person carrying on business. Now, uh, next section on presumptive is 44 ADA. 44 ADA is applicable for specified profession, right? There is uh, that word specified is very, very critical. Specified professions are defined under the Income Tax Act, refer section 44 AA. The section is 44 AA, where uh, sorry, 44 AA. Yes, that specified profession is prescribed, and they maintain the uh, books of accounts to be maintained uh, by specified professionals. So, chartered accountant, lawyer, doctor, architect, or anybody who has technical knowledge is a specified profession. And there are non specified professions also. A lawyer need not be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, if, they, if there is a professional, they are doing a, uh, say, for example, a photographer. There is a professional photographer. 
but he has he is not a specified profession there will be a non specified professional also it is not necessary that um, they are carrying on business there could be situations where there can be non specified professionals also but this particular presumptive taxation option is available only for specified professionals and the section is 44 ada the presumptive rate for a professional is 50% and here the fundamental difference in the case of a business i i told you a person carrying on business has the option to uh, adopt a presumptive method under 44 ad or he can go by a normal method where he has to make a profit and loss account and compute his profits and declare his profits whereas in the case of a professional the minimum rate there is no option by default he falls under 44 ada he is expected to declare a minimum rate of 50% profit now the limit is 50 lakhs in the case of a professional so that is why we told in the beginning of our session it is very very important for us to understand the the activity carried on by the person by the taxpayer is a profession or a business now here here itself i will ask you one question or we will say we will connect it to tax audit why am i talking about presumptive taxation when this session is about tax audit here itself you can catch i am sure a student is three times uh, smarter their brain is more sharper because they are students a student's brain is always sharper than see i always tell my students once you finish your ca you are a fixed asset whereas when you are doing your ca you are a capital wap what is the difference between capital wap and a fixed asset in the case of a capital work in progress there is no depreciation right we will claim a depreciation only when after the assets get capitalized so depreciation means definitely reduction in the value so after finishing your ca after you become a professional you will start depreciating in terms of uh, in terms of your student sharpness a student is always more sharper because he is reading on a day to day day to day basis and he is expected to understand it much faster because he has to write an exam so why i wanted to say is this uh, see the, these words it, it has to remain in your head 44 ad business presumptive taxation is possible and or normal method is possible whereas a professional 44 ad a the limit is 50 lakhs and the presumptive rate is 50% so if they declare the rate <laughs> suppose a businessman or a professional uh the uh, they 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 are into presumptive the businessman has opted for presumption presumptive method of taxation and a professional has chosen to declare the percentage of profit lesser than these rates what is the presumptive rate in the case of a business either 8% or 6% depending upon uh, the nature of receipt uh, or if it is a prof specified professional the profit percentage he is choosing to declare is 50 less than 50% which is 45% or 30% then they attract tax audit their accounts has to be audited and an audit report has to be given by a chartered accountant under section 44 ab that is why we have to understand the provisions of presumptive taxation here is the section <clears throat> i have just highlighted some of the important words which i have already explained to you with this understanding if you read i am sure all of you will faster understand not withstanding anything to the contrary this is called a non obstante clause if you have not heard the word non obstante clause n o n o b s t a n t e non obstante means irrespective of whatever is mentioned in the other portion of the income tax act this is like a stand alone special provision that is why if you read the heading it is called as it is called as a special provision what is special provision it is a special benefit given by the government by the income tax act for see they have fixed a limit what is the limit 2 crore so they say if you are a businessman who is carrying on a business and who has to gross sale within 2 crores i consider you as a person who can enjoy some benefits i am ready to give you a beneficial provision that is why it is called a special provision where they told that look you don't have to mandatorily maintain some books of accounts like your cash book journal and all and i assume that you you don't have the difficulties when is when you say books of accounts we have the vouchers bills invoices then cash book journal ledger bank book all those on and so forth you don't have to mandatorily maintain that uh, books of accounts have been defined so you don't have to maintain that i don't as an income tax officer we don't expect you to maintain that uh, books in a prescribed form or prescribed manner you maintain enough uh, you have you can report your income based on whatever data you have availability 
like your bank statements or GST returns or cash book or Uh, turnover is within uh, two crores. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. So, this two crores is relevant for a businessman. And so, in your head, you can understand, you imagine the balance sheet of government of India, right? So, a businessman who is carrying on the business who has a sales of two crores is definitely a small, we can call them they are, as a small time businessman. So government is making a special provision to enable the small time business people. They told that, see, you declare minimum 8%. So why I told 8%? So a sum equal to 8% of on this, on what you have to apply this 8% on turnover or gross receipts of the city on account of such business as the case may be, or a sum higher than the aforesaid sum. Are you able to see that word? A sum higher than the aforesaid sum. Yeah. So what is higher? That means, it is you you should not understand that always presumptive means eight percent. No. Sometimes there could be a situation where he made ten percent profit based on the data available with the person. They say that I made a profit of ten percent or I made a profit of twenty five percent, then you can you you have you have to declare that twenty five percent and shall be deemed. The word deeming, this deemed word is very important. As you grow in your profession, this word has a lot of importance. As students, you understand deeming means presumption. They are deeming that this could be your profit. And another critical word in this is, so what are the critical words? Presumptive basis is a critical word. Notwithstanding is a critical word. Then another two, three words I'm trying to bring to your attention is, the word is eligible business and eligible assessee. Eligible assessee and eligible business. So we have to understand who is an eligible assessee and who is an eligible, what is an eligible business. That means, again, he's telling this beneficial provision or this special provision to declare your income on presumptive basis is given only for the people who are carrying on eligible business and or that person should be an eligible SSE. What the, the, the particular section defines this, whatever I'm showing is from your income tax act, please go and read who is an eligible SSE, an individual. So here see, you see in the beginning of session, I told you, you have to understand what category of person is your taxpayer is. This is why an individual or a HUF or a partnership firm who is a resident, very, very critical. We have residential status under Section 6 of the Income Tax Act, where based on the physical presence, we identify the taxpayer as a resident or a non-resident, right? Now, this presumptive basis is available only for a resident. This is very, very important. Suppose last year, the person has declared the tax uh, income under presumptive basis, but this year, you understand, depending on his physical presence, we understand. So you have to ask that question number of days present in India. Very unlikely we, we might miss this point in this season because in July, definitely all of us will not miss because we know residential status is very critical to compute the income. There is a chance we might miss this here in this season because the focus is on business audit, tax audit, company audit, caro, uh, so on and so forth. But don't miss this point because if the person, the moment a person is opting for presumptive, your brain should work. You have to make sure the person complies with the provisions under section six of a resident, right? So section six is the residential status section. Please note down, please go and read and when a person is a resident and a non-resident. So this is available only for a resident as a C and it is not available, but not a limited liability partnership firm as defined under the LLP Act. Why they specifically talk about limited liability partnership here? Because as a common definition of a firm under the Income Tax Act, a firm is defined under section two of the Income Tax Act. A firm includes Firm 2, subsection 2, 23 of the Income Tax Act defines a firm. So a firm definition, if you see, uh, if my memory is correct, it says firm shall include, firm shall have a meaning assigned to it under the Indian Partnership Act. And it says it includes LLP. So firm in a common parlance in, uh, from the income tax point of view, anywhere in the act, it includes LLP. So that is why he wants a, uh, in this particular provision, he is excluding LLP. So that means if your taxpayer is an LLP, they cannot use for presumptive. Please understand this exclusion is only relevant for this section. That is why he is defining an eligible asset. Understand? This is the speciality of income tax act. That is why I told you, I'm sure in your notes, uh, tuition notes or study material, they would have given uh, 4480 not applicable to an NLP. That's all they would have given. That is 100% important, 100% required only for, for your exam as a student. Definitely you should need that. But this opportunity, uh, you are getting to understand 
firm for the purpose of income tax act as a whole includes an llp but for this particular provision they have nicely excluded llp because that is why he is defining an eligible assc so why eligible assc is defined because he wants to exclude certain category of taxpayer and if you see visibly there is no company so companies cannot use presumptive taxation now in this context and who has not claimed a deduction under 10a so these are some special sections where uh, the profits have some special category where it is exempt they are an export oriented unit or so on and so forth that particular sections if they are claiming any deduction there will be very rare cases but if your assessor is claiming any the deduction be alert they cannot claim presumptive taxation and what is eligible business every time you have to read this don't uh, you uh, i'm not joking every time when i do even after this much every time i go and read because income tax act is so vast just because you pass an exam or just because you practice for 20 years or 15 years or 10 years that doesn't mean that you by heart everything why i am telling this point is for a very specific special thing because there is a possibility your audit manager or even a partner would have missed some point okay so if something comes comes across your uh, uh, you know that is why called all of us have the same kind of accountability at various levels in a ca office so we are doing something you are working on a uh, on a team and you have an audit manager you have a chartered accountant partner but something as a ca student coming to your attention and your understanding is different from what uh, is has been done in the firm in the i mean in the books of accounts or in the filing of the thing you please discuss with your audit manager always people will appreciate it right so eligible business and eligible assc everything every time when you read 44 ad you go and read okay you should get a doubt whether the person is uh, an eligible assc is he carrying on eligible business this question should be in your mind whenever you come across presumptive taxation this i am not talking only from the tax audit point of view even next year when you do individual season also is it he is he an eligible assc is he an eligible is he carrying on eligible business what is eligible business any business except so they have excluded a business of plying hiring leasing goods carriages under section 44 ae and whose turnover or gross receipt does not exceed 2 crore so here is the place where he is bringing the rider of 2 crore this is 44 ad for you and as i told you under section 44 ab i'll come i'll show you that section when a person choose a presumptive method a person carrying on business opted for presumptive method and choosing to declare profits lesser than the rate of 8% or 6% as the case may be then they have to get their accounts audited under section 44 ab okay and one more condition here is even if the person declares less than 8% let us assume somebody has a turnover of 1 lakh rupees and they declare if 8% means how much profit they have to declare 8000 rupees now it is a profit and not tax 8000 rupees 1 lakh into 8% is 8000 rupees profit they have to declare suppose the person choose to declare say 5% 5000 rupees as profit right in that case as per what i told now he has to get the accounts audited under section 44 ab whereas there is one more provision where they say if the income is less than the minimum amount chargeable to tax then he doesn't have to get the accounts audited this is one benefit one more benefit given to a small time taxpayer where after even if he opts for a, he is a, he is an eligible uh, assc he carries on eligible business he has opted for presumptive method and his turnover is less than 2 crore and he is declaring a rate of tax less than 6% or 8% even if it is less than 6% or 8% his gross income his total income is less than minimum amount chargeable to tax what is minimum amount chargeable to tax is 2 lakh 50000 if it is less than that he doesn't have to get his accounts audited this is another provision under 44 ab so here also that minimum amount chargeable to tax that basic exemption limit what we talk is applicable only for an individual and a and a, and a uh, huf right in the case of partnership firm that basic exemption limit is not applicable so if if it is a partnership firm that 2.5 lakhs rule is not applicable please be alert to that fact right then so not this so this section whatever i spoke now is explained in this section and uh, this is one situation where he has to get the accounts audited or there could be a situation where the turnover crossed 2 crore see last year he, he was having 1.5 crore this year the turnover has become 3 crores then what happens he will not be eligible to take presumption that much you understand then we will understand when we have to get whether he has to get his accounts audited or not right now uh, this is presumptive taxation uh, so here is the one see if you see clause 5 notwithstanding anything contained in the provision foregoing provision of this section an eligible assessee to whom provisions of subsection 
are applicable. Subsection 4 is the place where he has opted for presumptive taxation and whose total income exceeds the maximum amount which is not chargeable to tax shall be required to keep and maintain such books of accounts and other documents as required under section 44A and get them audited and furnish a report under section 44AB. So under subclause 4 is the case where he has not declared the profit. If you see here, the uh, eligible SSE declares profit for any previous year in accordance with the provisions of this section. That means he has opted for presumptive taxation and declares a profit in any of the five assessment years. So every five year he has, once he opts for presumptive taxation, there is a lock-in period of five years, right? If the turnover is not crossing two crores in any of the five years, please keep in mind, the person carrying on business has opted for presumptive taxation and has not crossed two crores in any of the five years. Once he opts for presumptive taxation, he has to continue to declare profits under presumptive taxation in, five, in those five years, unless his turnover crosses two crores. So where an eligible SSE declares profit for any previous year in accordance with the provisions of this section means in accordance with this section means 8% or 6% as the case may be, declares profit for any of the five assessment years relevant to the previous year, succeeding the previous year means the first year and the next five years, not in accordance with subsection 1. So subsection 1 talks about the rate of 8% and 6% I have highlighted. If he is not declared, if he has opted and he has declared the profit lesser than the rate, he shall not be eligible to claim the benefit of this provision for the next five years. So once he has declared the rate lesser than eight years, uh, sorry, 8% or 6%, the next five years, he cannot go for presumptive taxation. So I get into presumptive taxation. I decided to declare under presumptive method five years, I will enjoy. I have to declare that 8% minimum or 6% minimum or the actual profit, which I desire. One year, what I did, I am in the third year of my business. I have opted presumptive method, but what happened? I, I chose to declare a profit lesser than 6% or 8% as the case may be. I declared 5%. Though I am within that third year, that year onwards, what happens? Two things comes in place. One, thereafter, for next five years, third year, next fourth year, I cannot go back to presumptive taxation. First year, presumptive. Second year, presumptive. Third year, though my turnover is within two crores, I declared a lesser profit. Then I came out of the presumptive taxation. Then fourth year, again, I cannot go back to uh, presumptive. Next five years, after the third year, suppose you are the third year, 2023, 2001, he opted uh, presumptive taxation. 2002, he opted presumptive taxation. 2003, uh, 2023, sorry, 2021, opted presumptive taxation. 2022, opted presumptive taxation. 2023, this is the third year. And this year, I chose to declare a lesser profit than the presumptive rate. Then from 2004 to next five years, up to 2000. Uh, 2003 plus next to five years, 2008, 2028, I cannot get into 44AD provision. That is first condition. He shall not be eligible to claim the benefit of provision under this section for five success assessment years. Subsequent to the assessment year, learned to the previous year in which the profit has not been declared in accordance with the provision. So this is financial year 22-23, which is the assessment year 23-24. So next to five years, that means 23 plus five, 28-29. 28-29 assessment year means financial year 27-28. Most of you who are listening to me would have become a chartered accountant by that time, right? May, may be done post-qualification course also. So uh, 28 assessment year, 28 up to that year, he cannot opt. Uh, though his turnover is within, he satisfies all the conditions, he cannot opt for 44 AD benefit. This is one condition. And he gets into this and he declares a lesser profit. As I told you, he has to get his accounts audited. But one more mafi, one more provision, they told that if his income is, so if total income exceeds, so when he has to, so 44AB is coming here, see, nothing contained in this provision, apply an eligible assessee to whom provisions of four is applicable. That means he got out of presumptive by declaring lower rate and whose total income exceeds the maximum amount, which is not chargeable to tax, that is 2.5 lakhs, shall be required. So benefit gone shall be required to keep and maintain such books of accounts and other documents as required under section 2 or subsection 44AA. 44AA sub, uh, section talks about books of accounts. Under subsection 2, you can see and get them audited and furnish a report of the audit under section 44AB. So this is the case where a person who has opted for presumptive will attract a tax audit. Go and read this section and again and again. And if you have any doubt, uh, uh, Sahana has my mobile number. 
please whatsapp me i will answer i will i can help you not a problem i may not take your call but you can say that you have attended this session or in uh, today you go back today say after session you go back or tomorrow morning you have full day time you read this doubt you can ask any of the subsequent speakers also all of them will be practicing chartered accountants coming and addressing you ask any of them or you can even come back and ask me you are welcome to ask me doubts so you go back and understand this section for want of time i have to move on so this is the section where a presumptive person who is opting for 44 ad attracts a tax audit going forward these are the salient features which i have doc, uh, already declared turn over to crore relief from maintaining books deemed to have so deeming fiction is the the 8% or 6% is given after that you don't claim any expenses the assumption is 100 rupees is your income 8% is your profit means what does it mean 92% is you have expenses so out of 100 rupees 92 rupees expenses you have incurred is assumed so any expenses under section 32 38 is deemed to have been claimed so you can't claim again the expenses from 8% block of years is 5 years and declare specified percentage and relaxation advanced tax portions now it is the time of advanced tax in this context what are the four due dates june 15 september 15 december 15 and march 15 we have the responsibility to pay advanced tax of 15 45 75 and uh, 90% of your taxes in advance but the person who has opted for presumptive method they don't have the responsibility to pay advanced tax of 15th june 15 september and 15th december installment they have to pay the advanced tax only 15th march installment if you don't pay the advanced tax what are the two sections interest 34b and 234c will be attracted whereas in the case of a person who is who has opted for presumptive taxation if they don't pay these three installments no interest will be calculated only if he, he doesn't pay advanced tax in the march installment 234b c interest will be calculated going forward not applicable these are the specific exclusions llp company non resident specified professional specified professional the section is 44 ad and the person carrying on agency business this is very critical a person carrying on agency business will have a nature of income commission for example lic agent or a del credder agent or a sales or somebody who is a distribution agent be sure that the person is having a commission income from agency business please ask whether they are doing an agency business then they cannot offer presumptive taxation though he is a businessman going forward same logic same analogy they have applied for specified professionals so specified profession has been defined under section 44a which includes a lawyer doctor chartered accountant uh, an architect accountant uh, and also technical consultant they can opt for presumptive tax they, so here there is an option there is no option it is a provision where the computation of profit is on presumptive basis the assumption is 50% only for specified professionals who is engaged in a specified profession he, they have to declare the profit of 50% here also the same rule applies if the rate of profit is declared less than 50% they have to get their accounts audited and uh, same here if here also if you see not withstanding anything contained in clause 4 and as i see who claims that the profits and gains of business profession are lower than so unlike 44 ad there is no block of 5 years here you understand 44 ad 4 we read block of 5 years whereas here there is no 5 years if he chooses to declare just the section says not withstanding anything contained in any other section and as i see who claims that his profits and gains from business uh, for, sorry from profession are lower than so here i read from profession means from specified profession be very careful this 44 ad can be adopted only by specified professionals there cannot be it cannot be adopted by people who are not not who are not specified professionals are lower than the profits and gains specified under subsection 1 what is the uh, rate of profit declared in subsection 1 it is 50% they are required and whose total income exceeds maximum amount which is not chargeable to tax so here also the 2.5 lakhs rider is there if he is an individual and if he declares a profit less than 2.5 lakhs no need to get accounts audited suppose he chooses to declare a profit less than 50% and that income exceeds 2.5 lakhs then they have to maintain the books of accounts and get the accounts audited under section 44ab so these are the relevant clauses for clause 4 and clause 5 are the clauses which talks about the situation where 44ab audit is attracted for the person who chooses presumptive taxation these are the salient features specified professional 50 lakhs relief from maintaining books of accounts and assumption is the expenses have been claimed and declaration less than percentage relaxation in advance tax provision for the professional also there are exclusions this is the presumptive taxation summary of presumptive taxation now these are the 
uh, allowed deductions to compute your turnover. Uh, this is a straightforward thing. There is nothing to explain. This is, if, if you read that guidance note on tax audit, they have defined a turnover. For want of time, I want you to uh, show you the form. So please go back and read this. Uh, what is, how turnover is computed. To, when you compute the turnover, when you compute the turnover for the purpose of uh, determining tax audit. Now, when tax audit is applicable, I'm coming to that. Uh, uh, this for determining the limit of turnover, these are the things which are specifically deducted. They are called allowed deductions and they are, they are not deductible from turnover are these, okay? And what is the difference between a cash discount and trade discount is also explained. Some questions I have included, if time permits, we'll come back to that. Otherwise, you can go and try back uh, uh, check in office. And these are the some of the things which I have already told you. Uh, now coming to tax audit. So now another limit, when tax audit is applicable, the limits are threshold for a business. The limit is first, there are there are two, three limits or rather uh, three limits you can keep in mind or rather three, uh, yeah, three limits you can keep in mind. One is one crore. Keep this in your head. If the total turnover or sales or gross receipts exceed one crore for a businessman who has not opted presumptive taxation, a businessman who has not opted presumptive taxation, the limit for tax audit is one crore, first rule. Second rule, a person who has opted for presumptive taxation, I mean, rather a person whose turnover exceeds two crore can never opt for presumptive taxation. So opting for presumptive taxation or not comes up to two crores, right? If the turnover is within two crore only, option or non-option of tax uh, presumptive taxation is coming. If uh, they have not opted for presumptive taxation, the limit for tax audit is one crore. If the turnover exceeds two crores, then they cannot opt for presumptive taxation, tax audit triggers in. Third limit is 10 crore. This is a special provision. When 10 crore becomes applicable, if the total turnover, if the person carrying on business and the total cash transactions, physic when I say cash, physical cash transactions as reflected in the cash book, if the cash transactions is less than 5% of the total receipts, and total payments. So, so your cash payments should be less than total payments. Cash payments should be, cash receipts should be less than 5% of the total receipt. When I say total receipt, don't think only sales, go to the bank book and uh, sorry, so go to the cash book and total all your debit transactions except contra entries. And when I say payments, don't think only expenses, even advance payments, even the payment not made for advance, even purchase of fixed assets, not, don't go only by P&L account. Go to your cash book and see the credit transactions other than contra entries. When I say contra entry, deposit your bank and withdrawal from bank. Other than that, take your total, apply 5%. If the total cash trans cash receipts as less than 5% of the total receipts and or if payments are uh, and the total cash payments are less than 5% of the total payments, then the limit for tax, uh, tax audit is 10 crores. If it is up to 10 crore, not tax audit, above 10 crore, there is tax audit. This is for business. In the case of profession, in the case of profession, not only specified profession, any profession, the limit for, uh, sorry, in the case of a profession, not a business, in the case of a profession, the limit for tax audit is 50 lakhs. So if the turn, if the profession exceeds, if the profession exceeds, not, not only spec uh, specified profession, even non-specified profession, See, specified profession word is relevant for presumptive taxation under 44 ADA. That could be, as I told you, a professional, but not a specified professional. For example, a prof professional photographer. Just for a for a uh, for an example, I'm giving you. Okay, a non-specified okay. professional also, if he has qualified a professional examination, and if he is a professional within the definition of profession, he is carrying on a profession, non-specified profession also. The limit exceeds 50 lakhs, then he has to get his accounts audited. The limit is 50 lakhs. So as far as profession is concerned, the limit is 50 lakhs. And there is no rule of cash. That 5% cash receipts, cash payments rule is not applicable in the case of a profession. Whereas in the case of business, that rule is applicable. So a person carrying on business, you have to remember three limits. One is one crore. Uh, see whether the person has opted for presumptive taxation, then up to two crore, no tax audit. If the person has not opted for presumptive taxation, the limit is one crore. Then put it as the cash receipts and payments. If it is within 5%, the limit is 10 crore. If cash receipts exceeding 5% or cash payments exceed 5%, the limit is one crore. That is the limit. So for computing the limit, you need to compute the turnover. That is where the definition of turnover is 11. 
The turnover is defined in the guidance note, which I showed you. Please go and read your turnover definition in your guidance note because it is quite elaborate. We need one session exclusive to, to define what is a turnover. Now, this is 44AB section for you. Whatever I told, the limits they have mentioned, 1 crore, 10 crore, 2 crore, all those you will see here. And wherever the profits have been declared, lesser than percent it takes. So this is the key takeaway. Now I will show you the form, what we are going to sign. Uh, I have the forms here. Uh, I will show you the form. Uh, uh, here, form 3CA. This is a tax audit report, which the auditor will sign. You will generate a UDIN and sign. 3CA is applicable when the entity is subjected to audit under any other law. Are you seeing this sentence? When... A person is carrying on a business or profession and he is audited by under any law. This is very important. So mostly this will be applicable for a company which has to be subjected to audit under company tax, irrespective of the turnover. Even if the company has no income, even if the company has zero income, the company has to get audited under company tax, right? Whereas LLP, the audit mandatory audit under LLP Act is only if the turnover exceeds 40 lakhs. So if the if the, the entity in place is audited under any other law, the audit report format is 44, uh, form 3CA. Please make sure that you are choosing the correct audit report format. So in this case, the auditor is relying on the financial statements, profit and loss account or income and expenditure account or balance sheet. And uh, the particulars given in form 3CD here, see the word true and correct you will see here. In my opinion, and information according to the examination of books of accounts and all other relevant documents and explanations, the particulars given in Form 3CD are true and correct. So a tax audit report is always signed true and correct. This is one audit report. Another audit report is Form 3CB. Here, the wordings are more or less similar. It is true and correct. Only difference is the audit is there is no audit under any other law. So mostly this is applicable for HUF and individual where they may not be subjected to audit under any other statute. This audit report format has to be used here. This is also true and correct. If you have any observations or disclaimers or qualifications, there is an option to report your qualification. So this is an audit report format where the chartered accountant will sign and UDIN will be generated and you will mention for name of the firm and so on and so forth. Now, the next form, what we are showing is common for both the tax audit. Here quickly, another 10 minutes I will take. Please bear with me. Uh, I will... Uh, 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 start uh, at least first 10 or 12 classes I will explain to you. If you have any doubt in any of the classes which I explained today, uh, I request Sahana to bring it to the attention of the speaker tomorrow that uh, if the students need an explanation again, please make sure that they get the explanation. Uh, but I will try to uh, explain whatever I can for want of time, little rush. But if you have any doubt, please make sure you ask your speaker tomorrow, right? So first, up to first 10 sections, this is the 3CD annexure. So this is this is annexure to the tax audit report format. Form 3 yes. We are not able to see any form, ma'am. Screen yeah, has... I will, yeah, I will show you. Yeah. Maybe I have to just stop sharing. Yeah, one minute. Okay. Can I take another 10 minutes? Yeah, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No worries, you can. Yeah, yeah. Now, is it visible? Yeah, ma'am. So this form... Ma this could is... you also show 3A and 3B? Sure. 3CA. Is it visible? Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Thank uh, you. Yeah, ma yeah. So this is form 3CA where the audit has been done under any other. Or this is a form which is I have downloaded from the income tax website only. So uh, this form... The important point is 3CA form has to be used when it is audited under any other law. And uh, 3CB form, this is the form it looks like. And this is an audit report and no other, uh, the, the taxpayer is not subjected to audit under any other law. So this form. So in most of cases in your office, if you are using a third party software like Winman or Saral, they will automatically choose when you choose the name of the taxpayer. But as CA students, you should know this under which rule. and. In this, in this context, I want to tell that, see, all this, see, fundamentally, you should understand how the whole thing works. There is an income tax act which talks about section and there are income tax rules. What are the rules? How the provisions in the act is en enforced by the government is through the rules 
and all the forms is based on a rule so any form you take under the income tax act they will draw attention to the rule this is how you have to study so if you see form 3c a it is under rule 6g now if you if here the all the thing is there see there is a form 3c a under rule 6g of the income tax rules which is discuss which enforces which is the rule is relevant from the point of view of section 44a so any provision under the income tax act there will be a section there will be a corresponding rule and there will be a form you will not find any form under the income tax act which is not addressed to a rule right if you come across any form please ask your partner there will be an explanation here so this rule also you go back and read in your office rule 6g so the rules and forms will be available in the big book income tax rules one book will be available in your office forms and rules are available in that form and act is separate so form 3cb is also under rule 6g 1b and 3ca is 61a a denotes business and b denotes profession under 44ab so 44ab if you see it is a profession and 44 ab uh, 44 aba this i am not talking about rule aba is business ab uh, ab mm, b is uh, profession so this is relevant rule and then coming to form 3cd this is rule 6g2 so this form 3cd annexure see the full form has uh, it starts from 1 and at the end you have i think 44 questions the last question number let's quickly see mm, for a minute uh part b part a uh form 3 cd so it has two parts the first part has eight questions which is basic information about the taxpayer and part b has questions running from 9 to the last question you have in this form if my memory is correct is 44 let us let me also refresh my memory mm, 33 36 39 44 yeah so here the tax audit report ends when you see a signature so it is question from 1 to 44 it is like a questionnaire it is like a questionnaire with relevant questions and annexures after this you will find the it is the end of the form and 1 to 8 is part a which is basically the uh, the basic data of the taxpayer and from part b 9 to 44 runs the relevant questions under various provisions which you are getting to hear in the next four days so part 1 to 8 are pretty straight forward questions name of the assessee address pan number or aadhar number please make sure that pan number is getting reported aadhar number is optional very unlikely you will have a situation where the person has no pan number aadhar number is optional pan number is mandatory it is not mandatory to give aadhar number then assessee is liable to pay indirect taxes so indirect taxes are gst earlier there was service tax so if somebody is old tax audit we are doing now service tax is relevant otherwise excise duty service tax and our sales tax and all are not relevant now because they all some subsumed under gst so uh, if the assessee has so please ask this question to your uh, taxpayer with the respective documentation in the form of a registration certificate Uh, what are the registrations he has and you have to report their number for example exporter means export import code under the customs act you have to report gst means gst act uh, that gst number you have to report there will be situations where the taxpayer has branches then branches gst number also because each state will have its own gst number so that gst numbers also you have to collect because in form 3c a you will see including the branches so somewhere they will say where the documents are maintained including branches uh, somewhere they will say that uh, so if you have a branch office that also has to be reported uh, so make sure that you ask the register maintained at the head office and branches you are seeing the word here branches see branches you are seen you are able to see right here also uh, with a copy of balance sheet accounts audited balance sheet books here there documents and explanations Uh, according to uh, somewhere they will so see the brand here actually here it is audited under other as here what happens here uh, you are relying on another person's audit report see under other law means the accounts would have got audited under other audit report that is why they are there is no specific mention of branches so here uh, coming back to this form what the point i wanted to drive is uh, ask for all the gst registry all the indirect tax registration numbers please ask a documentation don't only rely on last year's audit report 
please ask uh, if there is any change there could be a situation where he has opened a new branch office or there could be a change in the name uh, there could be a change in the name there could be a change in the address all those things you have to be careful then status here you know, i have i told you that status means under definition of persons individual partnership firm company all those things is relevant previous year which is previous year first april 2022 to 31st march 2023 assessment year 23 24 under the relevant clause under section 44 ab so in uh, the section 44 ab for the time being just quickly are you able to see the slide yeah ma'am 44 ab you see this clause a talks about business and clause b talks about profession okay and clause c i have only a and b here clause c talks about ah uh, see here sorry clause c also i have clause a talks about business clause b talks about profession clause c talks about the case where the person has declared business under 44 ae bb bb bbb if you have any assessees carrying on the business under these sections like uh, uh, goods carriages and all then 44 d is 44 ada where the person is a specified professional gross receipt less than 50 lakhs and opted for presumptive taxation then you have to choose 44 a b d and 44 a d our great business with the presumptive taxation 2 crore limit the relevant clause is a accordingly in your form you have to cho choose that sub clause able to see the form yeah ma'am yeah so that is that sub clause they are asking here in indicate the relevant clause of 44a b be very very careful when you do all this because as i told you you choose a presumptive taxation and uh, if the person is not a presumptive taxation it is a problem be very careful because you remember we are signing true and correct then this all of you are familiar these are 115 ba 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 b are all that new regime old regime where individual has uh, that special tax rate tax, tax labs uh, under new scheme or companies a special rate of 22% so if your assessee has opted any of these tax regimes please opt that then question number 9 pretty straight forward if it is a partnership firm or association of persons like a trust or anything please indicate the name of partners so here be very careful don't only rely on last year's report ask who are the, there could be a possibility there is a change in the partnership deed new partners would have come in partners would have retired all those things and their profit sharing ratio this is very important the ratio what you have to consider is profit sharing ratio not any other ratio please read your guidance note they say they say that there could be different ratios see for example there could be a ratio for giving remuneration there could be a ratio to share their interest from the capital that is not the ratio what it is asking their profit profit includes losses so profit and profit sharing ratio is what they are asking suppose there is a firm which has a different ratio for profit and different ratio for losses please report both the ratios if there is no space in this audit report please report that in a separate white paper and you can attach along with tax audit report you attach the financial statements so you can write that in a piece of paper and attach that along with the tax audit report when you file your tax audit report so any change the next question it is all straight forward and please read your guidance note they give ex ex very good explanations for each of these clauses nature of business whether there is any change compared to last year has he changed his business has he started a new business whether there is any change in the profession you have to ask this question it is a pretty, very pretty straight forward question nature of business or profession carried on during the previous year during the previous year means for, from april to march what business is carried on that we have to report here if there is any change please mention the particulars of change the next whether books of accounts are prescribed as i told you under section rule 6a uh, under section 44a rule 6f the relevant rule is rule 6f there is prescribed set of books of accounts for specified professionals for others there is no prescribed set of books of accounts so if you are filing the tax audit report for a specified professional like a doctor there is prescribed set of books of accounts that is the question they are asking here whether books of accounts are prescribed under rule 40 section 44 aa then what are the books prescribed so please read rule 6 rule 6f and section 44 aa if the books are prescribed for the category of taxpayer which you are uh, handling it is actually prescribed for specified professionals okay especially doctors then list of books of accounts maintained what are the books maintained cash book journal ledger bank books sales register purchase register don't simply tick all the books please make sure your client is maintaining the books which you are ticking because as i told you we are signing true and correct don't give wrong information if you have any doubt take the help of your seniors or partner don't do a wrong report then 
uh, here, uh, sorry, books of accounts maintained in computer system is also accepted as books of accounts. So that also they are asking. Uh, if the, in case the books of accounts are maintained in a computer system, mention the books of accounts generated by the computer system. If the books are not kept in one location, suppose the books are maintained in multiple locations, please make sure you are giving the address of the locations where the books are maintained. Then list of books and nature of relevant documents examined. There is a drop down coming in. Please choose whether they are maintaining. What are the uh, documents you have verified? You would have verified the books of accounts. In addition to that, you would have verified the bills for expenses, invoices for ex, uh, revenue. Then you would have verified the statutory returns and challenge, the TDS returns, the TDS challenge, PF remittance challenge, bank statements, all those things, whatever you have verified, please report here. Then if your profit includes any of that uh, profits, these are all presumptive sections. We, dis we discussed 44 AD. Please report uh, if any profits. So whether the assessee, there could be a situation where the assessee has two business for one business, he has opted presumptive, another business he has not opted presumptive. So they are asking whether profit on loss and account includes any profit which is declared on presumptive basis. Pretty straightforward question. Method of accounting. This I already discussed with you. Whether cash basis or mercantile basis. Mercantile basis means accrual basis of accounting. You have to choose this. Please see the last years and also see the books of accounts. Whether they are payable entries, receivable entries passed. Then it is not cash basis. It is mercantile basis. We have to be very alert on this. If you say cash basis and if the SSE is maintaining books of accounts in accrual basis, our report is wrong. It is not true and correct. What happens if you give a wrong report? There will be a gross negligence. Institute can take action upon the partner. Don't think that they will come only after the partner. The firm as a whole, there will be issues in systems and process. They can take out the working paper and they can prove that the work, the report is wrong. So please make sure that you are applying your mind when you apply this question. And so if there is a change in the method of accounting, there are a, a subsequent questions where you have to show the impact. Suppose the SSE changed the method of accounting from cash basis to accrual basis. If the profit was computed under cash basis, what could have been the profit? And since the profit is computed on accrual basis, what is the increase or decrease in profit? That has to be reported. Definitely as students, you will help get help from the audit managers. But there is a question. So when there is a change in the method, please be alert to the fact that there is an additional responsibility to compute the impact of the change in the method of accounting and compute your profits. Then, this is a section by uh, itself. Sahana, I request to please bring to attention to the speaker tomorrow to have a detailed, at least a little brief, uh, detailed discussion on ICDS because it is a chapter by itself. Only one thing I can say, a person who follows cash basis of accounting, ICDS is not applicable. Income Computation Disclosure Standards. A person following accrual basis, this is applicable. This is relevant for you if you have a taxpayer who is following cash base of accrual base of accounting. So tomorrow's uh, speaker, please make sure that you tell him to explain ICDS. There is really no time. So uh, ICDS reporting is there. Please remember that. I'm just skipping ICDS for want of time. Next is 14, method of valuation of closing stock. This is very important. You have learned accounting standard two. AS2 talks about valuation, either cost or net realizable value, whichever is less. So please ask if you if you are doing the audit of a taxpayer who is a manufacturer or a trader, this is relevant. Very unlikely you will have a situation in a case where it is a service provider. So in case of a manufacturer or a trader, you ask what is the method of accounting or method followed for the valuation of closing stock. You have to ask the question. And if there is any deviation, suppose there is a change in the method of valuation, please. We have the responsibility to bring in the impact of that method change in valuation. Be very, very alert on this. Please ask this question. Don't simply copy what is reported in the previous tax audit report. So as I told you, the entire tax audit report is in the form of a questionnaire. You have to work very closely with your client asking all these questions. Don't simply rely on your previous tax audit reports. Give a particular following particulars of a capital asset converted into stock in trade. This is section 45.2 for you. Please note down section 45.2 of the Income Tax Act where they talk about a situation where the capital asset is converted into stock and trade. For example, for example, your client had a building as a fixed asset in the balance sheet. This year he became a builder or he became a person who is running a service apartment, service apartment business and he can't, sorry, he became a builder and he is selling. He was running a service apartment in his building. This year he decided to sell his building. So his building became a stock. A revenue asset, a current asset, unlike a fixed asset, he is going to sell the building as it is. In that case, he becomes a 
it becomes a case where the capital asset is converted to stock and trade. Another example, you had a client who had five cars and it was in the fixed asset. The client was claiming depreciation. This year, he chose to become a trader of the car and he has decided to sell the car as it is. Last year, he was running a cab, uh, taxi uh, business. For example, he had five cars and he was running a taxi business. So the taxi was his fixed asset. He was not selling the taxi car. He was running the taxi business to earn his livelihood or earn his income. This year, he has decided to become a trader in the car. So what happens? The car which was under fixed asset on which you were claiming depreciation became his stock. He is going to sell the car as it is. He has stopped the taxi running business. He is selling the car as it is. So car becomes his trading goods. He becomes a trader of the car. There is a change in the nature of business. He becomes a trader in car. So his capital asset, which is a fixed asset, became a current asset. He became a stock, which he is going to sell. So there is a situation where capital asset is converted into stock in trade. And there is a method by which the profits are declared. The profits is computed at the value at which the car is sold. This section 45.2, if you go back and read capital gains chapter, you will get to know. So that is what I told you. Here you see, by doing a tax audit, you are not only reading your business chapter, PGBP chapter, you are getting to get answers and report your uh, questions. You are getting questions to report on capital gains chapter also. And towards the end of the reporting, you will see section 56 related questions also asked. That is income from other sources. So other than salaries, you will get to understand, you will get to read your all five chapters of uh, five cha heads of income when you do a tax audit. Don't think it is only for business. So capital asset converted into stock and trade section 45.2, the year in which the asset is sold. In my example, suppose he sold, he convert, he decided to become a trader this year, but this year he didn't, 22, 23, he didn't sell any car. The, the profit from the sale of car will be, and also the capital gain on conversion of the capital asset into stock and trade becomes taxable in the year in which he sells the car. There is a special method of computation. So that questions they are asking, what is the asset? Date of acquisition, cost of acquisition, amount at which the asset is converted into stock and trade. These are the questions which is we are expected to answer. Okay, section 45.2, you read, you will understand the provisions. Next, amount not credited to profit and loss account. This is a very critical section where there could be a situation where the person has interest income, interest on fixed deposit, which is not refl reflected in the profit and loss account, but which comes in computation or any capital gains on sale of shares or any land or anything. So they are expected to report under clause 16 of the tax audit report. Then going forward, clause 17 is a special provision where the SSE has sold a land or a building. Question is very clear where any land or a building or both is transferred during the previous year for a consideration less than the value adopted by the authority, state government, referred to in 43 CA or 50 C. For those who are doing their CA final, they will understand. See, when you sell a capital asset, there is a government valuation on which stamp duty is being paid. If somebody is selling a land or a building, your taxpayer has sold a land or building on which there is a capital gains reporting. And if the sale value is less than the stamp duty value prescribed by the government of Karnataka or government of the respective state, then that has to be reported here. Details of the property sold, consideration actually received or accrued, value adopted by the assessing authority. And you have to see section 56 is coming here, see whether the provisions of section 43CA talks about the situation where you have to take the stamp value as the sale value. And 56 to 10 talks about the situation. The differential is considered as if it is taxable or differential is taxable in the hands of the SSE under income from other sources. So chapter uh, on income from other sources, section 56 to 10, it is a big clause having various situations in which income can be taxed in the hands of the taxpayer. So here income from other sources is coming. Please go back and read your section. Question is straightforward. Here they want to capture the situations where the SSE has sold any capital asset which is lesser than the prescribed value. Then question number 18 is very straightforward. Your favorite depreciation, section 32, block method of depreciation under Income Tax Act. Uh, you need to know what are the rates under the Income Tax Act? What are the different blocks? We have plant and machinery, computers, furniture and fixed assets. The respective rates 40%, 15% for building it is 10%. And at what point you will consider a deletion? Only when you actually sell the asset, there is a deletion. And when the block, uh, there are two situations in which short-term capital gain will come under Section 50, where either the block is exhausted or when the asset is sold at a value less, greater than the WDV. This, whatever I told you, is there in your DT material. For uh, I think it is there in the inter and final also. Go back and read your Section 32 
and that is ex, ex, uh, section clause 18. Clause 18 is specifically on depreciation. Read your section 32 of the Income Tax Act along with section uh, 50, uh, uh, section 55, that is depreciable asset. In what context short-term capital gain will come in a block method of depreciation and depreci depreciable asset uh, and what are the rates of depreciation? So clause 18 is pretty straightforward. What is the value of the asset? What is the actual cost? What is the rate of depreciation? Any any uh, sale or anything is reported here. Then next clause is clause 19. Uh, clause 19, these are very, very straightforward. Any admissible section. So what is the amount debited under these sections? I'm sure these sections, it is more familiar to a student than me because these are the specific sections under your PGVP chapter. Very straightforward questions. If your profit and loss account has any amount debited under these respective sections, please report and what is the amount admissible. For example, 35D, preliminary expenses. What is the amount admissible? You have a computation. You have to take over a period of five years, the preliminary expenses can be claimed, right? So what is the profit and loss account? They would have debited the entire preliminary expenses, but only one fifty is allowed or 5% of your cost of investment is allowed as a deduction. So that is what they wanted to say. This is 100% your application of what you have learned under PGPP. Amount admissible as per the provisions of the Income Tax Act, if any specified under the relevant provisions. So what are the relevant provisions? These are the relevant provisions. What is the prescribed allowed uh, admissible amount? You have to report here. Very straightforward question. And clause 10 D is very important. Amount paid by uh, the SSC, that means your taxpayer, to an employee as bonus or commission for services rendered where it is otherwise payable as profits or dividend. So in the case of a company, if the company had to pay a dividend to the shareholder, instead of giving as dividend, if it is given as a bonus or a commission, it has to be reported. Let us understand, five minutes I will take and I'll close this session. I know I have already exceeded the time. The, the idea is, in the case of a company, there was a dividend distribution tax. Now it is there, it is not there, there is an amendment. But this question was relevant when the company has to pay a dividend distribution tax. In that context, they wanted to capture, instead of paying it as a dividend, whether the company has given as bonus or commission. If the company has given as bonus or commission, the company will claim it as an expenditure and they will not pay dividend distribution tax. So they wanted to capture the violation. So this may not be relevant at this point, but that is the purpose of this clause. And clause B has very, very important. This is the last thing I'm talking today. Employee's contribution. As far as provident fund is concerned, there are two components, employer contribution and employee contribution. The employer contribution is paid by the employer from the pocket of employer from his uh, resources, whereas employee contribution is deducted from the salary of the employee. The responsibility of the employer to pay to the government, whatever deducted from the employee has to be paid within the due date as per the provident fund act, that is within the 15th of the subsequent month. So PF deduction, employee contribution for the month of April has to be paid by on or before 15th May. For the month of May has to be paid by on or before 15th June, so on and so forth. Whereas employer contribution, the employer has the time limit to pay within section, uh, within the due date for filing the return of income that is under section 139.1, right? This is very important for your disallowance under section 43B and 36.1. So 36.1, 36.1 talks about this PF uh, disallowances and 43B talks about PF disallowances. 43B talks about employer contribution, whereas 40, 36 talks about, 36.1 talks about employee contribution. Both due dates are different. Employee contribution, it is due date under PF Act, which is 15th of the subsequent month. Employer contribution, it is 15th, but it is 15th of the subsequent month. But if the employer pays within the due date for filing the return, that is 31st October, he still get a deduction. There is no disallowance under section 43B. So now I'm stopping here. I'm, I'm really sorry. I have exceeded the time. They told me to handle up to 20 clauses. But I really request the organizer, uh, Sahana and her team, to please uh, explain to the students the part B. Part A, I think it is pretty straightforward. Part B from class nine, the, the next speaker handle, you have to bring it to his attention or her attention because uh, though some of the questions are straightforward, what I request the students is to read the questions from one to 20 tomorrow. Please do your homework. 
please read the questions and the respective sections you have time tomorrow till 6:30 please today reading is impossible please go back to your office open this report and please read the clauses from 1 to 20 tomorrow and whatever you don't understand please make it a point to bring it to the attention to the organizers so that the next speaker will explain i'm sure that some of the clauses want some more explanation i'm sure so uh, i request the organizers to please bring it to the attention of the speaker to continue from part b class 9 and not from class 21 uh, so i thought uh, the introduction is more important and the presumptive taxation is important uh, I, I, as i told you there is it's already 9 o'clock half an hour is exceeded please uh, share my email id and mobile number you have it sahana uh, people can yes, ask questions on whatsapp 9449 this number any student can just uh, mention i may not take your phone call because for want of uh, time as you know i will uh, you will as equally you are busy i am also busy plus please post your questions in your whatsapp and it is not necessary as i told you you have to ask me the next 3 days or 4 days i think 3 days you have please ask your uh, speaker any of the questions they will be uh, most uh, uh, willing to help you out but uh, uh, if you are not getting an opportunity to clarify your questions please send me a whatsapp message and i will help my best to answer your questions thank you i really really appreciate all the students for staying back uh, and attending the session it is not easy 2 hours is a fairly long period especially for a student uh, and the virtual session is uh, much difficult to have a continued attention i am seeing 40 participants not moving uh, i i i really i have lot of uh, you know uh, affection only i should tell you are so young and it is not easy as members we ourselves i am very honest with you two hours attending a virtual session is really tough and especially taxes uh, on a working day all of you had a very tough day today i know at office so uh, i i appreciate all the students and please enjoy your tax season and i will tell you very honestly this is the time when you can enjoy your tax audit session because after you become a chartered accountant whether you are in a profession or in industry once you qualify as i tell the responsibility is different you may not be able to enjoy i use the word enjoy so please take this opportunity to make your dt very strong one paper in your tax uh, in your exam is going to be very strong and sure uh, with this tax audit take this tax audit as an opportunity to hone your skills and be an expert in taxes whether you like it or not tax learning tax will help to appreciate and understand in other subjects also that is my take thank you so much and i'm really sorry for exceeding my time thank you all for patient listening and thank you sikasa for giving me this wonderful opportunity it was coming i, I was not sure whether i'll be I, i'm not sure also even now whether i have done a justice uh, thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am this is uh, sikasa chairman here mr tupad yeah uh yeah. that was really a wonderful session from your side and i should appreciate that at the last moment you have taken up this and i personally and uh, the sikasa committee as well as the fetter uh, students fraternity ss uh, will truly be indebted to you for taking up this yeah i once again thank you from my heart uh, and uh, that's it ma'am but uh, sana can you please uh, give on the word of thanks to ma'am Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, sir, and uh, thank you so much, uh, CA Rani and our ma'am for uh, making all your time and giving us so much of inputs regarding this tax audit session. It was really wonderful uh, having. Uh, I I didn't come to know how this two hours went seriously. So from the beginning, uh, apart from the glitches that we had, it's common, but we had a really good session from your end. Uh, and we'll also take all the inputs that you have given uh, us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also request you to share the presentation that you have. We got inputs from the students stating we'll be uh, sharing the presentation or what. So if you share to us that, we'll be sharing to all the students as well. And yeah. uh, as mentioned by you, uh, we'll also be sharing your mail ID and uh, mobile number to them as well. They are uh, they have already asked us. So mm -hmm. any yeah. further doubts, I think they'll be contacting you. thank you so much for such a wonderful time and such a wonderful uh, presentation ma'am thank you so much from sikasa bengaluru uh, thank you so much i think i also request all the students to be to take part in the tomorrow's event as well so and you can just circulate within your uh, contacts the tomorrow's program yeah yes yeah thank you ma'am thank you rani ma'am thank you wishing all a very happy tax season thank you thank you ma'am 
uh, and also yeah whoever the participants are there uh, this is not a one day session we have the same kind of session continuing with further clauses from 21 uh, we have tomorrow day after tomorrow and 14th as well so please do attend the classes uh, for further uh, tax audit sessions and it would be a great session i uh, believe uh thank you so much all the students for participating in this tax audit any further queries you have you can uh, directly dm our uh, uh, vice chairperson that is me or uh, secretary sumitra rajpurohit or you can dm through insta that we handle sikasa bengaluru for any future queries thank you so much for attending